My dearly beloved in Christ, Father Kevin O'Sullivan says that the Gospels do not relate all the miracles our Lord worked. St. John says this, ex this explicitly, and he had read the other three Gospels before writing his own. He says in chapter 20, many other signs, in other words, miracles, also Jesus worked in the sight of his disciples, which are not written in this book. The raising of the young man of Niam from the dead in today's gospel is one of three such miracles given in the gospels. Most likely, there were more than three raisings from the dead. For our Lord told the disciples of St. John the Baptist that as a proof that he is the promised Messiah, that the dead would arise. Still, the gospel writers chose these three as sufficient to prove Christ's divine power. There seems to be a certain gradation in the three raisings. The young girl had just died. This young man was on his way to burial, and Lazarus had been buried four days, as if to show that nothing could impede the power of Christ, who is a ruler of the living and the dead. And the gospel talks about a town called Naim. It's about eight miles south of Nazareth. There's still a little village there. The disciples in a large crowd. This is the second year in our Lord's public life. His fame had spread far and wide, and crowds followed him to hear his preaching, but also to witness his miracles. The Gospel talks about an only son and that she was a widow. What a tragic case. She lost her husband earlier. She lost her only child and also her only support. A large gathering from the town. Human kindness is universal. The townspeople turned out in large numbers to show their compassion and to offer consolation. And the Lord had compassion on her. The sacred heart of our Lord was touched with compassion for the poor, widowed mother. And this, this, clearly this incident brings out the humanity and divinity of Christ. His human heart was moved at this tragic scene, and then as God, he was able to dry the widow's tears by restoring her son to life. Our Lord touched the stretcher. It was a custom on the Jews to anoint the corpse with spices and perfumes and then wrap it in a linen cloth. Coffins or caskets were not in use. The corpse wound up in the linen cloth was carried on a stretcher to the burial place and placed in the grave or in a tomb. Young man, I say to thee, arise. This was a direct command given in his own name, which proves that Christ is master of life and death. It's true that St. Peter, St. Dominic, and other saints have raised the dead to life. But that was invoking the power of God. Christ didn't pray to God to restore the young man to life. He commanded the man to arise from death because he is God himself. He who was dead sat up. The command of our Lord had an immediate effect. The young man who is, was dead is now alive and sits up on the stretcher. And it's interesting because this was written by St. Luke. St. Luke was a doctor, and then the way he wrote it was um, like someone was in a hospital. You know, they're lying down, and the doctor comes to see him, and then they sit up. He began to speak. There's, thus, there's no doubt as to the reality of his return to life. He gave him to his mother. Compassion for the sorrowful widow was the immediate reason for the miracle. But aren't Lord also had another purpose, to glorify his Father and also to prove to everyone that his teachings were true, confirming it by a miracle. 
Fear seized upon all. It was not a fear that, that something terrible would happen, but rather a reverential fear at finding themselves unworthy in the presence of Almighty God. And this is similar to the words of St. Peter. After he had caught this miraculous a group of fish at the words of Christ, he knelt down and said, Depart from me, O Lord, for I am a sinful man. My dearly beloved in Christ, the fear mentioned in the gospel was one of awe and admiration at this manifestation of divine power, the raising of a dead young man to life. If the gospel account had been fictitious, we would expect to hear a description of the elation and happiness of the mother and friends after the dead youth had been restored to life. My dearly beloved in Christ, there's three things that render death bitter. Remorse for our sins. Excessive attachment to material things. And also the uncertainty of salvation. But we have time to change that. By going to confession, by being sorry for our sins, we can make our peace with God now. And then not be tormented by that at the hour of death. If we're not overly attached to material things, then we'll be ready to pass away. And also, if you think about it, people, some people collect so many toys, so many material things, but when they die, they have to leave all that behind. And somebody else will take all of those toys, all those material things. So we need a sufficiency of material things. We just have to keep the balance. And then lastly... The uncertainty of salvation. Okay, what can we do to ensure that we will go to heaven? St. Alphonsus says, A devout servant of Mary will never be lost. And you may have told you before, uh, during an exorcism, I ask an evil spirit, is that true? Because he knows who's in hell. Has a devout servant of Mary ever been lost? And he said, no. But I can try. And then if we pray the rosary daily, Our Lady promised that we wouldn't be lost. We need to pray daily for final perseverance. Wear the brown scapular. Receive the sacraments often. And of course, practice humility and charity. My dearly beloved in Christ, the premature death of the widow's son has a lesson for all of us. Death claimed him in the very prime of life, perhaps... There was little or no warning. Death will also claim us. We read in St. Paul's epistle to the Hebrews, it's appointed unto men to die. It's an eventuality. There's no escape. Death may snatch us without previous warning, as it seemed to have done to the widow's son. Every one of us can say with King David, there's but one step between me and death. We can't calculate the day or the hour. A sudden illness, an accident, a seizure, a stroke, heart attack, who knows, can carry us off at any time. Christ said, watch therefore, because you know not what hour your Lord will come. Once we pass through the portals of death into the world beyond, it's appointed unto men to die, and after this, the judgment. Our eternal destiny hangs in the balance of that judgment. If death finds us in a state of mortal sin, then we're sent to hell forever. But if we're in the state of grace, we will surely go to heaven. And the ideal is to go atone for all of our sins now so we can go directly to heaven, have a merciful, easy judgment, and then go to heaven. The present is the time to prepare for death and judgment. Don't be presumptuous or tempt God by postponing repentance. Procrastination is very dangerous and it can be disastrous. We cannot continue in sin on the assumption that God will give us the necessary grace before death. That's the height of folly. 
God may accord us the grace of salvation, but then again, he may not. No one knows. Let us amend before it's too late. As we live, so shall we die. I'd just like to close with the story. The longest railroad tunnel in the United States is in the state of Washington. It's called the Cascade Tunnel. It stretches for eight miles between the towns of Bern, B-E-R-N-E, and Scenic. And it was completed in 1928 at the cost of $14 million back then. The story is told of an elderly mother living in the eastern part of Washington who wanted very much to visit a sister living in Seattle. But for years she would, was afraid to take the train because she had to go through that long, long tunnel. And she's thinking about all the possible things, being buried alive or something goes wrong with the train or being carried through this dark passage hundreds of feet beneath the ground. So she was very frightened. But anyway, one day she heard that her sister in Seattle was seriously ill. She had have to take the train. So despite her desperate fears, she set out. As the train sped toward the entrance, she became more and more agitated and frightened. But she was worn out because emotionally and because of the, the ride on the train to the point of exhaustion. Before the train reached the tunnel, she just dropped off peacefully to sleep and didn't wake up until she was on the other side. How much like death was the trip of that mother? Like most people, she was fearful of life's end. She knew that death had to be endured in order to land on the other side of eternity. Going through the tunnel of death is a fearsome prospect to all of us. But our Lord said, in many ways, death is like sleep. He said that when about the death of Lazarus. He said, Lazarus, our friend, sleeps. On several occasions, Christ called death to sleep. And presenting to us as sleep, our kind and loving Savior has taken away much of the dread of death. He endured the most brutal and painful death to redeem us and to make give us the grace of a happy death. So, just as in our day-to-day life, our repose at nighttime is rest after a long, hard day at school, at work, at home, chores. As sleep is a reward of service, people who work hard know how welcome repose is at night. Those who work over and over at their job, caring for their family, practicing virtue, know how much they can enjoy a siesta or sleep. And it's also the end of trouble. What a blessing to someone who's just had surgery or uh, have some injury or in their hospital. It's a blessing to the poor, to the troubled and the anxious. Work and weariness and worry and worldly cares cease when you're asleep. To all who suffer, sleep is sweet. But also, we're looking for eternal life. So that's what God has in store for us. As we said, as St. Paul said in the epistle, don't grow weary in doing good for we will reap the fruits of our labor. One day we will. God's word is true. He keeps his promises. And as long as we just keep trying and ask for his help, we will persevere and then enjoy his everlasting happiness. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.